spirituality class here in the old city of Jerusalem overlooking the Temple Mount. Today we're going to be doing a very special meditation. It's a meditation based on the Shema. The Shema is one of the key meditations of all of the Jewish people and it's a lot deeper than I think any of you realize. So if we, if you allow yourselves to kind of be taken away into the Shema experience, I think it'll be I think it'll be very powerful for all of you. Um, do you mind downloading a soundtrack for me? Uh, just pull it up on anything, Spotify or YouTube, I don't know. I think it's called Tranquil Sleep. And uh, Tranquil Sleep, and it's, the song is called either Pure Bliss or uh, something Bliss. Should be the second tra track on Tranquil Sleep. It's on iTunes. Anyone have iTunes here? Anyone got, I you have iTunes? Yeah. How is it that everyone doesn't have iTunes? And it's like... Pull up, try tranquil sleep. And, uh, okay, here we go. So we're gonna do a little meditation together. And the first thing you need to know about Shema is that the Shin of Shema has the highest frequency of any sound. And that high frequency represents expansion. And it represents the four corners of the world, which are, you know, directions expanding into the world. It's also, um, it's also the, the shin itself is expansive. It looks like a bonfire. Its actual elemental chart is carbon. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's fire. Shin <coughs> is fire. That's why the shemish is a burning ball of hydrogen. It's a hydrogen's mem. That's the mem of Shema. And the mem has no frequency to it. It's a monotonistic sound. Mm, as opposed to shh, if you put it on a graph, I meaning if you actually break it down in vibrationally, the shin has the highest frequency of any sound your mouth makes. And the mem has the most monotonistic lack of vibration of anything else. Which is interesting because the, uh, uh, you know what, maybe we'll just put fire. And here we'll put water. Uh, by the way, you'll notice that Hebrew is the thing itself. Like, fire, a shh, is like, it actually makes the sound of fire, and the shin is carbon, which is what fire produces, and, and, uh, and mem is water. But what's a mem made of? What's water made of? It's made of, uh, oh, the yud, by the way, is oxygen. So yud is O. So, so water is mem, yud mem, which is H2O. It's literally two H's and an O. So it's, it's, it's the actual building block. So everything, everything in Hebrew, it's a, Hebrew words are not symbols. Like the word water is a symbol for H2O. It's a, a mental symbol that points to this substance called H2O. Hebrew words are the thing itself. You know, there's certain Kabbalists that won't even speak Hebrew. Because they're just afraid of messing with creation itself. Because, because you're playing with the creation when you're speaking Hebrew. And I say the opposite. I say you should learn Hebrew. And you should, not that you should be messing with the creation, but your talk should be powerful. You should be speaking powerfully. Like, the words you're using should be the thing itself, not just symbols that, that uh, relate to it. Anyway, but the mem stands for water. And it's also, it's like, shh, shh. And the and this represents um, contraction. So the the mem represents contraction, and what's really interesting is that is that water is the ultimate solvent. Like if you put anything into water, it becomes water. You can take metal screws that hold buildings together. Put it in water, come back a year later, and it's gone. It's become the water. And the mikvah, when we go into mikvah, if you think about it, that, the, that human beings, when they get scattered by the physical world, meaning when the physical world, like we've gotten, our brains have kind of gotten scattered into our desires. So the mikvah kind of tightens you back up, brings you back. And when a woman, when a woman has her cycle, which could have been a life form, but was not a life form, it scattered. And, and so she goes to mikvah after that to be back together with her husband. And so too, 
a man, if his seed is, spit, is scattered, he also goes to mikvah to gather himself back. It's anytime we're scattered. Uh, f- uh, people work during the week, the six days a week of working is a very big scattering. For most people, their mental real estate has been lent to the world of commerce. And, but Shabbat's where our mind goes back to truth, back to God, back to reality. And so many men will go to mikvah on Friday to get ready for Shabbat. Part of their ritual of preparation for Shabbat is the mikvah. And, there, and some men start every day, like this man starts every day in the mikvah, and where I convert myself back to Judaism every day. I mean, I was born Jewish, but I, I go through a conversion every morning. Where I go under the water and I pretend I'm a Gentile for a while. And I, there's no mirrors into the water. Although I did once tell a Rebbe photographer that he should get a water camera and shoot a series of Rebbe pictures in the mikvah. But the, <laughs> anyway, but under, under that water, I pretend I'm a Gentile. And now if you stay under there long enough, you're gonna die. And so I like, okay, what am I coming up for? The answer is I'm coming up for a life of meaning. I come up for the life of meaning. Okay, but I'm still a Gentile, so I go under and I say, well, I'm gonna come up for the life of the meaning of a Jew. Come up. Okay, come up for the life of meaning as a Jew. And then what kind of Jew? I go back under and I say, I'm gonna come up for the life of a Jew who's like white fire dedicated to the service of the Creator. Come up again to the service of the Creator. Then I go to the hot side and chill out for a while. <laughs> just let my muscles relax. Then I go to the cold pool and I tighten things up. And I, but I stretch for like 10 minutes in there. It's really amazing if you've ever done stretching in water. It's like your body's fully suspended. You can go <laughs> deep into a stretch when your body's suspended by the water. Yeah, of course my neighbors are like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Not really, they're used to me. Jakob, you want to say something? On Basque, it's like your personal uh, ritual every day, or is that actually common, uh, common law? I've heard people talk about it before, but it's, uh, it's my personal ritual. Okay, so the fires, the expansion, that's the Yetzirah, and the, the, the water's the contraction, and that's like the Yetzirah, that's the getting yourself to be that lean, mean you know, servant of God machine, like to be, have yourself tightened up and really like in the, in the zone, you want to be in that zone. And that, again, that, I, that was just a discussion how mikvah takes us back to the zone. If we use it, use it for such. Now the next letter is the letter ayin. And the ayin is, the ayin is the I and that's the, the actual letter and the word I are the same. And what it means is to look deep. I mean, you get your scatterbrained, non-meditative brain focused into this meditation and now go deep into the following. And there's going to be a colon coming up after the word Yisrael. So the, the ayin represents to look deep. In fact, when people study Talmud in depth, it's called iyun. And the word ayin, iyun means to learn in depth, to go into the depth and depths of learning, is iyun. To be le ayin is to look deep into something. Okay? That's the ayin. So, shma. Try that. We're going to do this together, by the way. Let's start with the sh. Shma. And the, by the way, the ayin's guttural. So I'm not, I mean, you have to be like Yemenite to do it right. Only the Yemenites know it, like real pronunciation of Hebrew. We got any Yemenites here? So, okay, let's try it again. Uh, we're going to do Shema. Ready? Shema. Very good. Okay, excellent. And uh, interestingly, that men who are wearing taluses, which are, you know, the, the large you know, large uh, prayer shawls that we wear with the black stripes, which is the barcode for God to know who's praying. And the, anyway, we wear these big prayer shawls. We actually take all four corners and we wrap all four, we, we get all four corners of the strings. I've got them here actually. Uh, my, this is called a talus cut, katan, a small talus. But we get all four corners and we, we put them all on the webbing of our index, our little finger next to the neck, that finger, we put it on the webbing there, 
let it come out the top, representing the four corners of creation, meaning expansion, extension, the scatteredness, which is what we wear these for, is because when the brain gets scattered out and you start forgetting what you're doing here, the tzitzis are reminders from the word to peek, that seats is to peek at your tzitzis and say, oh my gosh, like I just totally spaced out and thought I should click on that website, but I should not. And, and so I remember to stay true to, my, to God with my tzitzis. And, and I gather those four corners, which is my scattered brain mentality. I gather them together, and then I take my right hand and I cover my eyes. Now, why we put it over the webbing here of that, of that skin is because your webbing is what much more sensitive than your fist. You know, your actual fist is calloused and it's strong, whereas the webbing is sensitive. Now, why do we want it on that sensitive part? And so we learn it actually from horseback riding, which is how people used to get around. And when you ride a horse, you don't just grab the reins fully and put, have that bit, you know, smashing the gums of the, uh, the, sorry, the lips of the horse. You need to be sensitive to the lips of the horse that you're riding. And the way you do that is by having, just like the lips are the membrane of the horse's mouth, you have them on the membrane of the webbing of your fingers, your little fingers, so that you're gentle on your horse. So people who ride horses actually use that webbing. So what's the connection in Judaism? Does someone want to put it together? Who wants to put it together? Put it together. Someone wants to put it together? Okay, I'll put it together. <laughs> the, the reason why we put it on the webbing is because if you really, really get clarity of God, if you really get clarity of God, you will shrivel up and die. Because you'll start to ignore your animals so badly that you, you'll start skipping meals. After a while, you'll just like, I mean, you're just gonna, why would you even shower? Like, all there is is God. This is all in a, a simulation. The rest of Shema, as we're about to go into, really in the end says that none of this is real. This is all a digital simulation that we live in. That's why we're gonna cover our eyes totally. Because, because not only do we close our eyes, we're gonna cover our eyes to make it really dark to get into the oneness, meaning the nothingness, which is the oneness. When you really get that, your animal's in check, and when your animal side's in check, who says you're even going to eat again? I know a Rebbe, as my personal teacher, but the Rabbi Friedman, the Hornish type of Rebbe, when he eats, which he barely eats, I mean, you, what you would call eating, he is, you, meaning what he does, you would never call eating. But it's amazing, he'll put the, the challah in his mouth, and while he's chewing it, he looks like he's gagging. I mean, that's how not animal, there's so little animal left that he has to force himself to swallow food. He's really, I mean, this man has only slept two hours a day for 40 years. And that doesn't include Thursday night, because he's got to prepare for Shabbos with study, so he doesn't sleep Thursday night. And Shabbos night, he can't sleep, because every time he tries to close his eyes, his eyes flicker open from the intensity of Shabbos. That's like, sh literally, like, shooting through him like an LSD trip. And good luck falling asleep tripping on LSD. <laughs> You're not going to be sleeping for a long time. And that's what it's like for him every Shabbos night. His first sleep he gets is after the chillant, which is highly understood. That's my mother-in-law. <laughs> now, you got our music? Where's our music? Oh, you got our music? What was it called again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I found it. I just... Tranquil Sleep. It's such a great soundtrack. I've been using it for everything. Here, I can do it. What, it's a ringtone? No, no, it's a... Uh... Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I would just keep... I keep it on all the time. Except I start noticing that I haven't moved in an hour. <laughs> can we borrow your phone a little yeah, bit? Yeah. Mind if I put it on Do Not Disturb for a few minutes? No. It's no problem, man. The reason we put it on the webbing is so you do eat. You gotta be sensitive to the horse, okay? You're the, your soul is the rider of the horse. Your soul's the horse's rider. And the body, and all your body's desires, that's, that's the actual animal, that's the horse. And you gotta make sure you eat. You gotta take care of yourself, and you gotta be married, and you gotta be, you gotta be sexually active. 
with someone who you can build a home with, someone who who's, you can trust your heart in their hands for the rest of your life. So we put the sitsis to represent, to recognize that, yeah, all there is is God, and that everything you see, lo tatu, lo sasuro, don't look after, don't stray after this world, but don't go so far that you don't get married. Don't go so far that you don't, that you don't eat. You gotta take care of yourself because your soul is dwelling inside of you. Everyone should start breathing now, like deep, slow breaths, in through the nose, out through the mouth. So you wanna be sensitive to your vehicle, but not to see your body as anything more than a vehicle. Hunger is an emotion. I don't know when the last time your body was actually hungry. In this generation. Yom Kippur, maybe. Hunger is an emotion. I only eat when my body's hungry. And I only eat what the body needs when it's hungry. It's taking a deep breath and we're gonna do the, we're gonna go from scattered to focused and then go deep with the ah. Ready, inhale. Let's do it again, this time with the R is closed, minor close, inhale. Now the next word of Shema is Yisrael. And if you think about the word Yisrael, it's kind of ethnocentric. Hear, O Israel. Only Israel? Like, did you notice there are another seven billion people in the world who probably need to know there's a God? Right? A little weird that it's like only Israel? Shema Yisrael, no one else? And you wanna hear something amazing? Leave it to our sages to be that sensitive that, you know what Rashi says there? When you click on the word Yisrael, it takes you to Rashi. And Rashi says, gee, that's ethnocentric, Rashi. What about the rest of the world, asks Rashi. And you know what he says? He says, for the Gentiles at this point of history to find out that everything's just a digital simulation would be too much to bear. It'd be too freaky. The Jewish people were at Sinai. They can say this three times a day. They can say it in the morning, they can say it in the evening, and before they go to sleep. They can say that this world is really just absolutely one with God. It's just a vibration. It's all a matter of frequencies, how fast the molecules move. But to tell the Gentiles that all there is is God, that this is all just one big digital simulation, that's too much. But Rashi goes on to say that in the end of days, there will be movies like The Matrix, Groundhog's Day, Avatar. What was that other one? Concept, Inception. Like, and Rashi didn't mention those movies, but he said that there will come a time where the whole world will realize, and very interestingly, very interestingly, that the whole world realized this after, without me going into the, the psychedelic details, but the whole world and Hollywood and writers and everyone realized this after the 1960s. So there was some big connection between the 1960s and this Rashi, and an era, an era that was ushered in that we're all part of today. I mean, we're dipped in it, because we were all raised after that era. And we are all dipped in this place where, where the world being a digital simulation doesn't sound too far-fetched. And it means once you realize that, you start to care a little more about the planet and about each other. You start to realize the oneness between us and the people around us. You start to care. Nevertheless, we're the children of Israel. And for us being the children of Israel, this is a special prayer for us. Because 
in the end, we're going to say Elokeinu, our God. And what does it mean that it's our God? <coughs> what it means that it's our God is we are the ones who had a prophetic experience at Sinai, and we're the ones who are all reincarnations of that prophetic moment. You see, that there's a God, everyone has. That it's our God, meaning not from a possessive place, meaning he's everyone's God, the God is everyone's God. But the fact that we as a tribe witnessed the nakedness of God, it's a marriage. It's our God, just like I, my wife is my wife and I am her husband. Because we got, we've exposed ourselves to each other fully. And when you get that exposed to someone, that's called intimacy. And intimacy, there's a certain level where you're one another's now. And you can create that level of intimacy with everyone because it's on a volume knob, meaning my wife gets a 10, but a cab driver gets a three. That intimacy, that oneness that all of us are, and I'm invested in people. I do crazy stuff for random people. Because that, there's part of me in that person, but, but when you're fully exposed, that becomes, that becomes my wife, or that becomes my husband. And your children who grow up in your house, yeah, they're God's kids, but they're, you'll say they're my, those are my children. That's my major responsibility. I gotta save the world, but I gotta take care of those kids first, and God's gonna have, God's gonna ask us about that. And I'll tell you, I'm scared to death personally. <laughs> Because I did, I did spend a lot of my children's upbringing with people like you, which meant automatically less with them. That scares me a bit. So my little nine-year-old last night asked if he could sleep with me last night. It was hard to say no. And let him snuggle up next to me for the night. At least sleep next to me. So let's take a deep breath and say Shema. This time we'll do Shema Yisrael. Inhale. Shema. Inhale. Yes. The word Yisrael also means to Yisur means to struggle, and Kel the Aleph and Lamed that Al at the end is is to struggle with God. Losing means winning. <laughs> to struggle with God and losing the struggle means winning. The next word is Hashem, which we don't say the actual letters. We're not allowed to, although the J witnesses use the word. Thank God they use the word J instead of Yud. The letter J instead of Yud. But we actually say the Adna word, which means master. But what we mean when we say the name Yud and He and Vav and He is Haya Hovet Yeh, was, is, and will be. In other words, the tortilla that surrounds space and time. God beyond space and time. And then when we say Elokeinu, I, it's too late for me to take questions right now. That's why I'm, we'll, we'll miss the rest of the meditation. Whose name? Whose name? What do you mean? God doesn't have a name. There's, God has no name. No, no, all those names are verbs. Every name in Hebrew... No, I'm serious. Every name in Hebrew, every single name in Hebrew is a verb. All the names of God that we use are verbs to describe how God interacts with creation. And this verb, this one, you might say, well, what kind of verb is surrounding space and time? And the answer is, it's the verb of expansion because it's from beyond space and time that God expanded the world into existence. So the name Yud and He and Vav and He is the name of expansion. 
The name on the doorways, which is Shin, Dalit, and Yud, is the name of contraction. Shin, and then, which means She, and then Dalit and Yud is Dai, which means in Hebrew, that's, it's enough. It causes order. Because our world not only expands, but it also, contra it's contracting into order. Otherwise, the world would just spin off into chaos. If God took that verb, Shin, Dalit, and Yud, that name out of creation, this whole room would turn into a blender. But not only that, our earth would fall out of orbit with all the others and just go like, and the whole thing would just expand into oblivion. That, that name, Shin, Dalit, and Yud, and the reason it's on your doorpost is because outside the doorway of your home is an ex a world that's full of fire and expansion. And it doesn't, it doesn't care about the values of your home. And so when you walk out of your home, you touch that shin, dalit, and yud, the contraction of a home with values, the tightening, the tight, the, the tight ship of connection of your home, your home as a place of, of godliness. You touch that mezuzah, you fill it up, kiss your hand, which really you're kissing the mezuzah, and then you walk out into the world and you keep the values of your home when you're out there. Your value, the values of your home are not for sale just because you left your house. Now, um, so the Shema is, the Yud and Hei and Vav and Hei is surrounding creation, and then the Elokeinu is filling creation. And what is the name Elokeinu? It means Elokim Shalano. It's a construct state of the word Elokim. Now, what's a Yud and Mem at the end of a word? Plural. Like, Yelid is boy, right? What is Yeladim? Children. Plural. So the name for God in plural is Elohim. Now some of you may be asking, like, how can the Jewish people, the hardcore monotheists of our planet, have a plural name of God? And the answer is, is that remember this is just a digital simulation. So how God shows up inside the vibrational energy of this world, in wood, in wool, in cotton, in flesh, how God fills this world is called Elohim. The state of God inside creation is called Elohim, and that's the word in Hebrew, in English, divine. How the world is filled with God's divinity is called Elohim. So now we have Shema Yisrael, we described. Hashem, surrounding space and time. Elokeinu, filling space and time. Hashem, that God that's beyond all this, the creator of it all, Echad, is one. Not that there's one of them, like the softcore monotheists say, but that he is one. And there is nothing else. Vehu Echad, Ve'ein Sheni. God is one. There is nothing but God. So here we go. We're going to say it together. We're going to do the whole Shema together. Everyone... Um, close your eyes, please. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale for Shema. Inhale. Shema. again. This time we forgot to cover our eyes. You're going to close your eyes but no, everyone close your eyes, breathing. And now cover your eyes with your hands tight and see how much darker it is. And you see the oneness of nothingness. Now inhale. Shema
Please everyone subscribe to my YouTube channel and uh, please share this on Facebook. Hit the click below and share it. And feel free to join the media club, yomtovmediaclub.com. Shalom everybody.